Tov Chabrim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. It is December the 24th, 2016. And uh, covering, continuing our coverage on the UN's latest moves uh, will cause Israel to retaliate. Now that's the way I've titled it. But I really wanted to go in depth about the whole situation about the UN's resolution. And a lot to do with, you know, there's a lot of our followers. We have a lot of Arabic followers. And I do have respects to the Arabic people uh, as well and their rights as far as being able to live uh, in the Middle East, just, just as I believe that the Arabs should respect the fact that the Jewish people have a right to live there as well. Uh, but I want to show and share with you from a prophetic side of this, as well as looking at the historical facts and the news that has been breaking with the UN resolution that just was passed here recently, where Obama uh, abstained at the US, they did not uh, try to block it or anything uh, to stop the settlements inside the West Bank there. And again, uh, we're going to cover both sides of this because I like to be unbiased as possible on any issue, regardless, even though being Jewish and I support uh, the, the, the Israeli people. Uh, but there again, there's many times that I don't support the evils that are being done uh, that happen there inside of Israel. And I call these things out. So I ask you to bear with me in this broadcast this evening. And we have many, many Christian friends. This is how our, this is how our channel started to begin with. Israeli News Live was not a news channel. It was actually Israel Returns or the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Now we do have a separate channel called the Noon Institute as of now on YouTube. This will air there tonight as well because we have listeners there that do not know anything about Israeli News Live. But I felt that the, this is very important to bring this out in depth for both sides there so you can see exactly what I'm trying to bring forth in this resolution and why I am not for the resolution. And maybe it might make a little bit more sense, especially for those uh, Arabic friends that we have that also that watch this channel as well. Let's move right along into it. And again, and again near the end of the broadcast, you're going to find a very powerful uh, uh, biblical prophecy that I think is going to get fulfilled as a result of this resolution. If we go to look though in the, in the Bible, if you go to Daniel chapter 11 verse 39, I'm sorry I didn't put it up there in the top there for you, it's actually Daniel chapter 11 verse 39. This is the famous passage that I believe has everything to do with from the very moment of the beginning of the British mandate back in the 1920s all the way to modern days today. Let's take a look at that. And he shall deal with the strongest fortress with the help of a foreign god when, uh, whom he shall acknowledge shall increase uh, glory and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for a price. Now, that's not exactly translated just right. I'll get into that in a moment there, but this is to kind of set the foundation for you of what we're going to talk about uh, because that foreign god, it's, a, it's, it's what he considers to be a god in a foreign land is what it really is. Uh, the Nacher is uh, what he's calling his foreign god there, but this is the British Empire and the foreign god that he is... Uh, whom he's getting the help from is none other than the Catholic Church, the Vatican itself, specifically. Not so much independent Catholic Church around the world, but the Vatican itself. So let's take a look at this. Let's go all the way back. In July of 1922, the League of Nations entrusted Great Britain with the mandate for Palestine, recognizing the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine. So Palestinian friends, let me just share with you. I know you've got several of you guys that watch as well. And you have to understand, Palestine, or what we call Palestinians today for the West Bank, was actually first labeled this for the Jewish people. Uh, there were Arabic people living in this land during this time, but there wasn't that many. You'd be surprised to know that back in the 1920s there, there was not even a half million Arabs living in all of what we consider the state of Israel as to, of today. Not even close, okay? In fact, as you can see here on the map here, coming down the Jordan River that goes right straight down to the Gulf of Aqaba here, this is what is called modern Israel today, but the British mandate had actually given them all of what we call Jordan 
You know, nothing in Syria, because Syria was under the French mandate back at that time. Because why? The British had toppled the Ottoman Empire. They had taken over this entire region. And there wasn't hardly anybody living in what we call Israel today. Take, take, keep in mind, including the Arab population in Israel, not counting the West Bank, there's like some 7 million people living there in Israel today. Excluding the West Bank, there's like in the Gaza Strip over here, there's a couple of million people living there. Then you take the people living in the West Bank as well. It's not that many. I mean, it's a lot of people now, but if you take back then less than a half million people encompass this entire region, uh, that's, in fact, not just here, there was, in, in the entire area where the British mandate was, there was, there was about a half million people in total in that region. Imagine that. Well, now we have all these people here today, which is a much, much greater, greater number now. But let's take a look at what it says. Recognize the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine. Great Britain was called upon to facilitate the establishment of the Jewish nation home in Palestine, Eretz, Israel, land of Israel. Shortly afterwards, in September 1922, the League of Nations in Great Britain decided that the provisions for setting up a Jewish national home would not apply to the area east of the Jordan River, which constituted three-fourths of the territory including, uh, included in the mandate, which eventually became the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. All right? So, then notice the way they're doing this. In the very beginning, all of this was going to go to the Jewish people. The entire thing. That's what the British mandate originally did back in, 19, in July of 1922. But by September 1922, well, what do you know? They cut it off with the Jordan River and everything to the east now belongs to the Heshmanite uh, uh, kingdom there, which are the Jordanians, or what, we, what became known as the Jordanians today. And we're going to get into a little bit, though, how that came about, all right? So just let's follow along with me here. Now, what we had happen the other day, the, U the UN chief welcomed Security Council resolution on Israeli settlement as a significant step. This is on the UN.org's resolution 2334. That's the number of the resolution that got passed uh, yesterday, December 23rd, 2016. United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon today welcomed the adoption of Security Council resolution which states that the establishment of Israeli settlements in Palestinian territory occupied since 1967 have no legal validity, constitute a flagrant violation under international law, are a major obstacle to a two-state solution and just a lasting comprehensive peace. Note that, excuse me, that includes Jerusalem. All right, now here's what's interesting. According to the mandate in 1922, all this was going to be given to the Jews, not to Arabs. All right. Now, it wasn't that the Arabs were going to be thrown out. No, not back in 1922. In July of 1922, the Arabs were all going to live there, but it was going to become a Jewish state. The British had the power to do that because the British controlled the entire region. The French controlled the Syrian region. All right. Uh, even Iraq was under British control, all right? So all this was under the British control. And they had given this part of the land to the Jewish people, called the British Mandate. And again, there was no uh, throwing the Arabs out. There was only half a million Arabs in the land at that time, in the entire region. They were going to coexist together. But something began to change, and it has everything to do with Daniel 11's prophecy, which I'm going to come back to in a moment, all right? So, let's go back again. So, what happens is they're saying now that they have no right to have the settlements there, that it's illegal. But even in September of 1922, they cut it off at the Jordan River, and they said the Jews would get everything to the west of the Jordan River, and to the right, the Arabs will end up getting that. Actually, the Hasmoneans... Uh, a, Hesh, a Heshmite kingdom of Jordan would get this. Now that was actually awarded to the king, or, or a man that was made to be king because he'd helped fight the, the Ottoman Empire, and so it was given to him as a gift. All right? Now this is really where, if you're going to divide Arabs from Jews, that's where the Arabs would have been living at. That's why I say what we call Palestinians in the West Bank today are actually Jordanians. 
because they were part of the same group of people here was over here. But they got separated, all right? Again, according to the mandate in 1922, there was no, no, there was no throwing the Jews out here and throwing the Arabs out here. But I guarantee you one thing, in the, in the Resolution 181, it was the other way around. They were going to divide the, this part here to the left into two different states, and they were going to throw out Arabs out of the Jewish side, and the J Arabs were going to throw the Jews out of the Arabic side. Can you believe a resolution by the United Nations would be so prejudiced as to say that the West Bank, as we call it today, and the Gaza Strip would be Jew-free, and the Israeli section would be Arab-free? That's how prejudiced the United Nations was in 1947 Resolution 181. Go read it. The link is in the description below so you can see it for yourself. That's what they did in Resolution 181. So when Mahmoud Abbas is saying he wants it to be Jew-free, according to Resolution 181, that's the way it's supposed to be. But the Jews, though, listen, my Arabic friends, listen, the Jews are not asking for their country to be Arab-free. But your resolution calls for that. Isn't it strange how things just change? I mean, it's so evil and ungodly of what's going on. Now, let me, let me break down Daniel 11.39, though, because as we're seeing, it's changing continually. British Mandate, July 1922. Everything that's including Jordan and all of modern-day Israel and the West Bank, Gaza, all that was going to be given to the Jews. A few months later, by September of 1922, now they cut it in half. They give the, from the Jordan River to the west to the Jews only, and from the right, they give it over to the, you know, the, 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 what we call the Jordanians of today, right? Hmm. And then they divided it again in 1947, and they're trying to divide it again yet today. So it keeps happening. So let's look. I did a literal translation for you. The Asa. Well, I won't bother to read, read in Hebrew for you. Just literally it says, And made their fortress mighty with a foreign god, or a foreign land. All right? This is how they made their fortress mighty. What fortress? The British Empire. With the help of the Vatican. And why do they call it a foreign god in a for, or a foreign god in a foreign land? It's because the Vatican was in Italy. The British Empire became strong with the covenant that they had made with Rome. The Babylonian Empire, Mystery Babylon. Remember, that mother church, she has a military. She rides, as we see, Mystery Babylon, that, that, that woman rides, the scarlet-colored dressed woman rides that beast. And that beast was the Roman Empire. Now, the United States is still a part of the Roman Empire. If anybody thinks that the United States won its independence 200, uh, 200 plus years ago, we're sadly mistaken. They rewrote the history to let you think you did, but you never won. As an American, and I'm an American, we never got our independence from Rome. We still pay our taxes, go straight to the British Empire. The British Empire pays its royalty to the Vatican. That you didn't know that. That's why you have three city states in all those three in three countries. In Italy, you have the Vatican State, uh, the Holy See, as they call it. You have London, which is a city state within the entire country of Great Britain. You have Washington D.C., which is a city state independent of the entire United States, and that is independent of Virginia. Hmm. So, and made their fortress mighty with a foreign god from a foreign land, in other words, whom he knows and he greatly respects. And they govern many. And the land he divided for a price is for gain. Okay? Now, he knows and he greatly respects, and they govern many. He greatly respects the Pope of Rome. All right? And they govern many. Let me just show you what it means by govern many. Take a look at the map here. Everything in red has been part of the British Empire. Either was or still is. Australia still is. All these countries, of course, England, Ireland, the United States, it's still, still a British Empire. Canada still makes their allegiance to the Queen of England. All right? 
South, South, South of Central America, part of the Dominican Republic there, uh, you know, different uh, countries in, in, in North, uh, uh, North South America, the northern part of South America, the British coastal of Africa, British Congo, British Angola, British Southwest Africa, British, British South Africa. Do you realize in every one of these nations that are in red, do you know that at least 30% of the population has a, has a British DNA in their bloodline as well? That's no joke. So tell me they don't rule many. As it says here, and they govern many in the land he divided for a price. All right? Now, but that's the interesting thing. When we look on the map right here, in Syria and there, you don't see it as part of the British Empire. But back in 1922, it was. Isn't that interesting? 1922, all the way until 1947, when she pulled out, it was part of the British Empire. And in fact, there was supposed to be a red dot right there sitting on Jerusalem. That's the part they weren't going to give up. That's what they were going to give to the Vatican. And I'm going to prove it in this right here. This is why I'm trying to get you to understand. Even the Palestinians that are, that are listening to this broadcast or any Arabic uh, friend that might be listening, let me tell you something. I'm not here against you. You know, you see, my I, I've stood with President Bashar al-Assad. I have stood with him and his right to govern his own country. And even in 2013, I submitted to the Pope of Rome that he would surrender under certain conditions. Well, the Pope didn't accept it, did he? No, he sure didn't. I kept on warring against it. So see, I'm not against the Arabic people. You know, I don't agree with Islam. No, I don't. I, I just, that's just my personal belief. But that's, that's, you know, you have a right to believe what you choose to believe. But what I do see, even in the case of Mahmoud Abbas, he is being played by the Pope of Rome. Now, Abbas knows he's being played by the Pope of Rome, but the Palestinian people have no idea that they're being played by the Pope of Rome for their own benefit. All right, so let's continue on so you, I can make this point to you. So maybe it will help the Palestinian people as well, because if you realize who you're being played by, you could actually bring peace to this region and we wouldn't have all the conflicts. All right, so now in 1766, this is kind of go back to show you, because remember the, the, the biblical passage said here, and he made their fortress mighty with a foreign god. So let's look at that. Let's look at the history of this. In 1766, the Pope recognized the English monarchy as lawful. And this led eventually to the Roman Catholic Relief Act of 1829, the diocese replacing districts were reestablished by Pope Pius IX in 1850. Apart from 22 Latin Rites dioceses, there, there is an Eastern Catholic Diocese in the Ukrainian Catholic uh, Eparchy of Holy Family of London. And by the way, I don't know if you know this or not, but in London, there is still part of the remnant of the wall when, when London was considered the, under the Roman Empire. Did you know that? Historically, London was part of the original Roman Empire. And that, there's still part of that wall there today. Well, they are once again part of the Roman or Babylonian, mystery Babylonian Empire of today. All right. Now, see what happened, though. The popes were realizing long, long, long ago, and even especially in the 1800s, when they began to see, uh, well, let's get into that. That's, an, that's our next frame anyway. Palestine Land Development Company, land purchasing company of the World Zionist Organization. Now, I realize, and I want to make this clarification as well. Biblical Zionism, in other words, Jewish people returning to their homeland because they want to see the Messiah. I am in favor for 100%. And I don't think that anyone should be against that. All right? Political Zionism that has come under the control, starting out with the Rothschilds and under the control of the Vatican, I am dead set against. Because that's against the Jewish people. It's against the Jewish people and their right to come home, which you will see tonight. All right? So I'm not for the political Zionism. But... I want to say this because there were two types of Zionism. One was for the Jews just wanting to come home. Established in 1908 by Arthur Rupp and a German Jew as a part of the World Zionist Organization, the Palestine Land Development Company, PLDC, used Jewish national fund and private monies to purchase and populate tracts of land with Jewish immigrants. It acquired extensive holdings in northern Palestine, Galilee, particularly in the 1920s and 1930s. But before that, when, when this whole region was still under the Ottoman Empire, the, the Ottoman Empire had allowed the Jews back way back in the 1800s, 
late 1800s, around 1870, the Ottoman Empire, began, they, they eased the restriction on Jews being allowed to purchase land inside of what is now today called Israel. And they allowed them to go there and purchase land. And they did so, starting down in Joppa, what became known as Tel Aviv. And they began to buy land up in mass quantities. The Iranian Jews, the Iraqi Jews, the, the Jews from, uh, from down towards Yemen, all these Jewish families began buying large swaths of land and they began to take over this, this region of the world because, like I said, even here in the 1920s and 1940s, there's only a half million Arabs in the entire region. So for the Jews to come in and buy land, it was not hard to do and it was not hard for them to settle this region. That is the way to return to the homeland legally by the law of the land and the Arabic laws were allowing them to do this. But Rome did not like that. That's why Rome began to reestablish ties with Britain in order to bring about World War I to put down the Ottoman Empire. And if you look at the history on it, you'll find out that is true. The Catholic Church wanted to crush the Ottoman Empire for allowing the Jews to turn to the homeland because why? Rome wanted control of the Holy Land, as it's called. They wanted control of it, and they didn't want the Jews getting a hold of it unless they had control of it. This is why World War I came about. This is why the Vatican, all the way back here in, in 1766, the Pope is trying to reestablish that ties with the British monarchy there because they know that the Jews are going to try to get the land, and they got to be able to bring down the Ottoman Empire in order to secure that land for themselves. And even... Even when, when uh, before World War I, as you see here in 1908, you know, they're already, again, the Jews are continuing to build, to put together, to bring monies together to be able to buy land. All right, so by, particularly in the 1920s and 1930s, the PLDC bought nearly 90% of its land from large landowners rather than individual peasants. Many of the transactions created controversy, such as the PLDC's purchase of 240,000 uh, dunums, and I don't know if the nums is, uh, uh, no, I don't think it's the same thing as a hector. hector. Hector is what they use in Europe a lot of times, and that's about, I don't know for sure, I think it's like three and a half, four acres to one hector. Anyway, they were buying land at 144,000 acres, uh, or, or 60 hectares, okay, that's what they got in there, 60 hectares, of fertile land in the Jezreel Valley between 1921 and 1925. It was its purchase of 30,000 denums. 18,000 acres or 7,500 hectares and the Wadi Hawarith in 1929. That's what was freaking Rome out is that they were doing this and they began to work on putting a halt to it. That's one thing for sure. We'll get to that a little bit later in this broadcast here. Let's move on though. The iconic image of the General Allenby entering Jerusalem uh, on foot in 1917 at, at World War I. There's been a lot of things that have been said that when Alibi was coming up, that the Arabs were told that Allah was coming, and this is what made them give up the city without firing a shot. But I do have a lot of respect for General Allenby because there was a good friend of his that was a, a believer in Yeshua, that is Jesus, and he had told Allenby, when you enter into the city, whatever you do, dismount your horse. Because when the Messiah comes, when he returns, he's the one coming on the white horse. And he's the one that will ride the horse in. So when you come, in respects to the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, dismount your horse. And Allenby, in respects to the coming of Yeshua, actually dismounted his horse and walked through the gates, the Joppa gates there in the old city of Jerusalem. The film director by Yaakov Gross and Eli Cohen shows that the taking of the Jerusalem was actually something of an anti-climax. What the general intends as a Christmas present to King George V was delivered on Hanukkah. The Turks had fled, and as, as all but 20,000 of the city's 50,000 mainly impoverished inhabitants, the only casualty was the Arab mayor who fashioned a surrender flag out of two sheets and succumbed to, to, to a cold a few days later. So, again, there was no casualties. And only 20,000 people in Jerusalem. Imagine that today. Much, much difference in numbers there. But this is where things get kind of interesting. And this is what I want to bring out as the historical side of this because of looking at the prophecy of Daniel 11, verse 39. The British actually limited the uh, 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 absorptive capacity of Palestine by partitioning the country. All right, in 1921, the colonial secretary, Winston Churchill, as you see pictured here, rewarded Sheriff Hussein's son, Abdullah, 
for his contribution to the war against Turkey as a consolation prize for the Hayaz and Arabia going to the Saudi family. Churchill installed him in an emir. Churchill uh, severed nearly four-fifths of Palestine, some 35,000 square miles, to create a brand new Arab Emirate, Transjordan. So, this is when we see, as you can see, this is all the original land that was given to a Jewish homeland according to the British mandate. But Churchill, oh, he just decides to award a big old chunk to the Jordanian family now, Abdullah. And now he gets his own land there. This is, if you technically are going to divide Jews from Arabs, this was the Arab section that the Arabs were going to get. Once this happened, the Jews were actually hoping, what you see here in blue, this is what the Jews were hoping to at least get then, if nothing else. That's what they really were hoping for, that this would become the national homeland because they kept seeing that the British kept dividing the land. And why are the British dividing the land? Because remember, Daniel 11, verse 39 says, they divide it for a price, for gain. Whatever does them good, that's what they divide it by. And the fact that we can see biblically that Britain is that fortress. They are that military power that Rome was using to take the Middle East by World War I. In fact, Rome was very much behind both World War I and World War II, bringing about both wars, and both wars were serving a purpose. World War I was to stop the Jews from continuing to buy up the land in that part of the, that part of the region of the world, because there was a lot of it for sale. All right, a lot of it was being sold and being bought by Jews, and the British did not want that happening. So they created World War I to slow that down and gain control of the land themselves, because the Turkish Ottoman Empire, excuse me, the Ottoman Empire had already permitted the Jews to return to the land and buy the land if they so desired to. So a lot of people, when you sit there and you, you want to throw stones at the Jews and say, oh, the Jews are just coming here, the wicked Zionists are just taking all the land. They were buying the land. The only ones that did the evil was when the Vatican brought in their own little thugs to run the government of Israel. That's the ones that have done the evil. The very Catholic Church, you Palestinian friends, are, are, are depending on to help you to have a, a Palestinian state. They, were, they are the ones that are, were beforehand working with the Israeli authorities to be able to forcibly take the land that they wanted them to. And you just got thrown under the bus and have no idea. Let's look at more of this. Again here, and this is from uh, the, the, uh, and the link is in the, in, in the description below if you want to look at where these articles are coming from here. It's, from, it's about the British Mandate uh, website here that tells about these things. No refugee from the Holocaust. The gates of Palestine remain closed for the duration of the war, Second World War. Because you know why? Before the Second World War, the Jews began flooding into you know, Israel. They began to flood into there trying to buy up land because there was already a lot of persecution in Nazi Germany from the Nazis. So they started coming in. So what happens, uh, says, stranded hundreds of thousands of Jews in Europe, many of whom became victims of Hitler's final solution after the war. The British refused to allow the survivors of the Nazi nightmare to find sanctuary in Palestine. On June the 6th, 1946, President Truman urged the British government to relieve the suffering of the Jews confined to displaced person camps in Europe by immediately accepting 100,000 Jewish immigrants. Britain's Foreign Minister Ernest Bevlin replied sarcastically that the United States wanted to displace Jews to immigrate to Palestine because they do not want too many of them in New York. How ridiculous. No, you're just under... Vatican control, and they made sure you didn't allow any more Jews into that part of the world without their authority. So, we go on. The British gave in further to Arab demands by, by announcing in 1939 a white paper that an independent Arab state would be, would be created within 10 years and that Jewish immigration was to be limited to 75,000 for the next five years, after which it was to cease, all, was to cease altogether. By that time, anyway, they had 80,000 Jews living in that part of the world. Only going to allow 75,000 more and never another, another Jew allowed to come into the land. Hmm. It also forbade land sale to Jews and 95% of the territory of Palestine. The Arabs nevertheless rejected the proposal. Now, now, see, this, is, this, is the, this was the British 
taking and changing the map guidelines and was not going to allow Jews in anymore. Again, back to Daniel 11, 39, they divide the land for gain. Whatever got them some money, whatever the highest bidder maybe, or whatever would serve their purpose. By contrast, throughout the mandatory period, Arab immigration was unrestricted. In 1930, the Hope Simpson Commission sent from London to investigate the 1929 Arab riot said that the British practice of ignoring the uncontrolled illegal Arab immigration from Egypt, Transjordan, Syria had the effect of displacing the prospective Jewish immigrants. Again, just so you'll see, this is why on the map here, we have what we call Palestinians today living in the West Bank and Gaza. Gaza was going to be much bigger at one time, by the way. This is Transjordanians. Excuse me, this West Bank is Transjordanians. Egyptians. They had migrated illegally into the country. And that's why we have so many Arabs living there today. Now, I'm not against the immigration. And... I think that both Arabs and Jews should be able to live together in the same country. And I don't think that it should be all divided up. But they're going to do it anyway. So you're not going to change it. Now I want you to notice something though here. UN Resolution 181 changed everything again. Independent Arab and Jewish states and the special international regime for the city of Jerusalem. That's why you see this white circle right here. Yellow for the Jews and... I don't know what color, the grayish color there for, for, the, for the Arabs that were living in there. And the Arabs were actually, you know, they actually, the United Nations proposed this to them, and they rejected it. And here's what's weird. They set forth in part three of this plan shall come in existence in Palestine two months after the evacuation of the armed forces of mandatory power has been completed, but in any case, no, no later than October 1st, 1948. The boundaries of the Arab state, the Jewish state, and the city of Jerusalem shall be as described in parts 1 and 2. Now, in this same document, they're going to talk about how that... <laughs> it's really weird. There was to be no Arabs living in... No Jews living in the Arabic side. In this particular map right here. And again, they changed it from what they promised the Jewish people back in 1922... Now they've divided it again. And they keep dividing. And they keep dividing. Why? Because the prophecy of Daniel said they would. And said they'd do it for gain. All right? Now, let's move on. The Vatican wants the Temple Mount taken from the Jews. This is an article by Guglielmo Miotti that was written on June 30th, 2015. You've got to see who's behind all of this. It's not just the British. Remember, the British is working with that foreign god or the god of a foreign land and the pope of rome sits in the temple of god as if he were god that's what he does sure he does he's called the vicar of christ which is the one that takes the place of jesus all right according to Guglielmo in his article he says the vatican and the plo agreements have been signed to enable the eviction of the jews from jerusalem this follows a memorandum signed by the palestinians and the vatican officials in 2000 which repeated the vatican call for an international mandate to preserve the proper identity and sacred character of Jerusalem. You know, that's one thing that's never changed. They, they, they will divide the land up between Arabs and Jews and cut this out and give this one that and give that one over here this and take this and take that. But when it comes to Jerusalem, it's never changed. When it comes to Jerusalem, Vatican wants Jerusalem. And this is how you know who wants it. All right, repeated the Vatican call for an international mandate to preserve the property and identity and sacred character of Jerusalem. It means a return to a time when a half of Israel's capital was under Islamic control and the old city was closed to Jews and the synagogues were desecrated and the walls bobbed wired and snipers divided the city by force. The Vatican is con uh, consistent. In 1964, and Pope Paul VI made the first papal visit to Jerusalem Jews and Christians with Israeli passports were barred from the entering the old city, and no Vatican official complained about that. What Guglielmo noted there. Now we come to modern days. Now, this is the new map, and you, you're not going to really recognize it that much yourself. We're looking at Jerusalem right here, but this here, the green line, is based on the Oslo Accords, 1993, that were signed then by Shimon Peres and the Vatican, they worked out the agreement, and all inside this red line here was actually part of Jerusalem. I actually lived in a neighborhood right over here. Now that is considered the West Bank. 
And so, when, in fact, the old city, sitting right in here, is all inside what is called the West Bank now. So when they're doing the resolution, saying that the Jews can no longer build settlements inside the West Bank, they're also talking about what has actually been part of Israel since 1967. They're going back to the, to the, to the recognized lines before 1967. This is where it gets dangerous, friends, and this is what I'm talking about. This takes the entire old city and puts it in Palestinian control. This is why they've been changing the names of locations, like in Bethlehem. They consider now the tomb of uh, Abraham, or, or yeah, the tomb of Abraham and Sarah. They consider this a Arab site, not a Jewish site. They consider the Wailing Wall an Arab site, not a Jewish site. The Temple Mount, a Jew cannot pray there. An Arab can pray there. I don't even know if a Christian can pray there, for that matter. But what about when the Word of God says that I would that man everywhere, at all times, with uplifted hands, pray without ceasing. But we're not allowed to pray there at the Temple Mount. And yet there is plenty of artifacts that prove that that was where the second first and second temple actually sat. Where is the equality in all of this? All right, again, here, this is on Google Maps, the dotted line, the Oslo Accords. Right here is where they built this eco bridge that I said will be a checkpoint. This was before Google changed it in 2016. This used to be on the other side of Highway 1. Now you're going to have to go through the West Bank. When you go through the West Bank, before you get to Jerusalem, you're going to go through a checkpoint. They're calling it an eco bridge. It's a checkpoint. That's what it's going to be very soon. It's just a matter of time. To back up what I'm telling you, Shimon Perez, the Vatican's president of Israel. This is what Barry Chalmish wrote, the late Barry Chalmish. It's not Barry pictured in the picture here. It'll be on the next slide. Barry, a new Barry, very wonderful man. Um, anyway, in March 1994, the newspaper Chadashot revealed a most remarkable secret, Barry writes, of the Middle East peace process. A friend of Shimon Perez, the French intellectual Mark Hotler, uh, which is pictured to the right, claimed in an interview that in May 1993, he delivered a letter from Perez, as Shimon Perez, the late Shimon Perez, to the Pope, within Perez promised to internationalize Jerusalem, granting the UN political control of the old city of Jerusalem and the Vatican hegemony of the holy sites within. The UN would give the PLO a capital within its new territory, East Jerusalem, would become a kind of a free trade zone of world diplomacy. You see it happening. That's what the resolution, I think it's 2334, that just got passed. That's what's, they're, they're setting it up now. They're doing it by force. Hmm. Shimon Perez, the Vatican's president of Israel, Barry Chamish. You know, I say by force. I don't believe it's by force. I've always stood by that too, that I'd never, I always believed that it would be given to them. Shimon Perez gave it to them. Okay? It's not by force. It was given to them by Shimon Perez. Shimon Perez, continuing on in the article, Barry Chamish here. In March 1995, the Israeli radio station Arut Sheva was leaked a cable from the Israeli embassy in Rome to Perez, foreign ministry in Jerusalem, confirming the handover of Jerusalem to the Vatican. This cable was printed on the front page of the radical left-wing Israeli newspaper Haaretz. Two days later, a scandal erupted and numerous rabbis who had invited Perez for Passover services canceled their invitations in protest of his treachery. Perez reacted by claiming that the cable was real, but that someone had whited out the word not. The cable really said that Israel, Israel would not hand Jerusalem over to the Holy Pontiff. Outright lie. Yes, he did do it. And yes, he did promise it. And yes, they got it. That's what we can see here when we see here the Pope of Rome sitting in the upper room with his crown on, his little fish god crown, where he serves Dagon the fish god, uh, He's wearing that hat right above King David's tomb. Now, before the Pope of Rome, and I have no problem with the Pope doing a communion service in the upper room. That wasn't the issue. It was the fact that the Israeli government, without any referendum, had given the Pope an official seat at King David's tomb. That's not right. That tells you that this is not really the Jewish people's land, at least by the United Nations and the Vatican's laws. 
And then the Pope comes and he holds the communion there, puts a crown on his head where he's given an official seat at King David's tomb. He's given that official seat there to show that he's what? The King of Israel. And that Jerusalem belongs to Rome. All right? So, Giulio Miotti, or no, this is, I'm sorry, this is actually from the AsianNews.it on May 26, 2014. The, the Eucharist celebration in the upper room was the last event in Pope Francis' pilgrimage to the, to the Holy Land before his flight uh, home to Rome tonight. Here the church was born. He said, and it was here that she set out in a place that reminds of the service of fraternity and sharing harmony, peace, promise, but also of the uh, pettiness, curiosity, and betrayal. Yeah, it's a betrayal, all right. I got I to read something to you guys, so apologize for having to jump off screen here for just a second. And I'm doing this for the sake of those that maybe have never heard this broadcast before. And by the way, I know many of you guys, whether you celebrate Christmas or not, uh, many people, especially in America, it's a holiday season, even for the Jews who have, Hanukkah's already passed, but you'll still go visit loved ones because everything's pretty much closed in America. Share this broadcast with your family members. I, I encourage you with all my heart, share it with everybody you possibly can. All right, now, I'm going to show to you, though, this here, this fulfilled a, a, a magnificent scripture in the book of Obadiah right here. Most people have no idea that it did. But in Obadiah, in uh, verse, um, what was it? It was verse 16, I believe it is. Uh, yes. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. So yes, he's on Mount Zion. He's drinking on Mount Zion. And the interesting thing is, is in the Hebrew language, it's in the masculine plural. And by the way, he drank a communion with men only, and that's according to the, only, the Catholic news itself. But the following week, there were other denominations that came there as well and did a communion service, including Catholics, including Greek Orthodox. And then they even threw all the Jews out of the tomb of David forcibly by special forces of the elite Israeli military, threw the Jews out of, the, out of King David's tomb, and they did a communion inside King David's tomb. You tell me they're not exercising their authority that Jerusalem has been handed over to them, according to the 1993 Oslo Agreement made by Shimon Peres. Yes, it is. All right, now, we're getting close, close, getting winding down now. Let's look at this real quick. Pope Francis calls for an end to Israeli-Palestinian stalemate. Los Angeles Times, May 25th, 2014. All right, it says here, previous popes always came to the West Bank after first arriving in Tel Aviv, Israel. Francis, however, landed at Bethlehem on a helipad from Jordan, headed into an official welcoming ceremony and meeting with the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas. Standing alongside Abbas, Francis declared, the time has come to put an end to this situation, which has become increasingly unacceptable. He said both sides needed to, to make sacrifices to create two states with internationalized, recognized borders based on mutual security and rights for everyone. Isn't that interesting? Do you know that's in scripture as well? To my Palestinian friends, listen to what it says here. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, and he shall come up and become strong with a little nation. Actually, the small Gentiles, small number of Gentiles. That's the Palestinians. But it says it happens really strongly after a, a league is made, a league that is supposed to be made beforehand. What league is he talking about, Dan? What do you know? Orthodox Rabbinic Statement of Christianity on December 3rd, 2015. The, what they call the Jewish World Jewish Congress. Not to be mixed up with the Knesset. And this is only a small number of the rabbis listed here. Signed an agreement with Rome. They signed a league with Rome. Recognizing the Vatican and the Vatican signing that agreement, recognizing them. 50 years of the Nostra Aetate which was signed after nearly two millennia of mutual hostility and alienation. We Orthodox rabbis who led communities, institutions, and seminaries in Israel, the United States, European, recognize the historic opportunity now before us. An historic opportunity. Sell out your own people for your historic opportunity. We seek to do the will of our Father in heaven by accepting the hand offered to us by our Christian brothers and sisters and Jews and Christians must work together as partners to address the moral challenges of our era. 
God told you not to make any covenant when you came in the land. Okay? That's what he told you, but you did it anyway. So we have all these rabbis on here. David Bigman, David Bolak, David Brodman, Nathan Lopez Cardoza, Alan Goshen, Goldstein, uh, Irving Greenberg, United States, Daniel Landes, Lanz, Israel. All these different rabbis, many of them, to sign an agreement. A lot of the Orthodox rabbis were up in arms over it. Okay? Now, there's another scripture that got fulfilled, though, because of the things that's been going on, thanks to the Vatican. Uh, on Israel National News, there was an article by, again, Guglielmo Milati, who's an Italian journalist, and he wrote this. He, he quoted uh, a cardinal called uh, Louis Jean Tron, who works in the Vatican itself. Very interesting uh, quotation. There will not be peace if the question of the holy sites is not adequately resolved. Again, they're trying to get Jerusalem, okay? Uh, Cardinal Tehran said, the part of Jerusalem within the walls, within the holy sites of the three religions, is humanity's heritage. The sacred and unique character of the area must be safeguarded, and it can only be done with a special internationally guaranteed statute. Resolution 2334 gives them that statute they've been wanting. Oslo Accord, 1993, Shimon Perez gave them exactly what they wanted. Now, Ezekiel 35, verse 5, prophecy that's been fulfilled, been fulfilled 2,000 years ago and is being fulfilled today in the last Antifada that took place in Israel. Ezekiel 35, 5, because thou hast had a perpetual hatred and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end, because thou hast said, these two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess it, whereas the Lord was there. It has two different verses in Ezekiel 35, five verses apart, verse 5 and verse 10. Notice, these two nations, these two countries shall be mine. A Palestinian state and a Jewish state. But Rome is claiming it. How do we know it's Rome? Because it's Esau. In Esau, we know it's Rome because of why. When David and Saul were trying to, they were warring with, with the Edomites, they killed every one of them according to the biblical record on that except one. And that was a man by the name of Hadad, a little boy at that time. He escaped, he goes down to Egypt, he's raised by the, by the, king, uh, by the pharaoh of Egypt, but when he actually becomes of age and finds out that David has died, he asks Pharaoh to make leave. And yet he's married to the Pharaoh, Pharaoh's wife's sister. He grants him leave, but everything was just like Moses. Have I not done everything for you? Have I not got everything you want? Place to live, etc. He said, I know, you have, but I want to go back home to my people. He doesn't go down there to, to the land of Edom. He goes to Syria and becomes the king of Syria. Isn't it ironic that 2,000 years ago the Romans destroyed the land of Syria, just like they're doing it today through the NATO forces, they have destroyed the land of Syria. And then after they destroyed it, they took what was left of it and made it an ally so that in 70 AD they could destroy the temple and the sanctuary. After the Romans, though, of course, got full control of, of Israel. Then they destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. History repeating itself. NATO under the heavy influence of the Vatican, Syria nearly. Russia is their only problem right there, and that's in Daniel as well. When it says, tidings out of the east and the north trouble him. They didn't expect China and Russia to be involved in Syria, did they? But it's only to set aside. It's just for a short period of time that it troubles them. Anyway, this thing about the sword, notice that in verse 5, because thou had a perpetual hatred, Esau, by the way, he does, Hadad goes into Syria, becomes a king. Later, his descendants, they marry in amongst the people there. He goes from there to northern Africa and then into modern-day Italy, where Rome is. And that's how we know that it's uh, Esau's descendants, because Obadiah clearly def uh, defines those that destroy. Daniel does as well. Daniel says that the one that, was, that would destroy the temple and the sanctuary would be of the people. See? See? That where the prince shall come. The prince that shall come is the Pope of Rome. He'll be the prince over Jerusalem, all right? Whether it be, whether it be the Pope you have now or another Pope, doesn't matter. He'll be the prince over Jerusalem, all right? Now, but the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary were the Romans from Italy, modern-day Italy. 
All right, so we know that the that shows you that it's Esau's descendants. Not only that, Obadiah says, I think in verse 6, that Adam is the one that destroyed, Esau is the one that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary, Titus the Roman general. So we can biblically prove that the Edomites are the Romans or the Vatican today. Now, it says here though, and has shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity and the time that their iniquity had an end. The calamity, clearly identified by Daniel, was the destruction of the temple, 70 AD. That's their calamity. The time that their iniquity had an end, Daniel 9 also refers to when Israel's iniquities have an end. That's in modern days, where Israel is about to be redeemed by their Messiah. And again, they used a sword in the times of the Romans, and today, as you see pictured here in the Third Intifada, the sword was being used once again at the advent of the coming of the Messiah for Israel. Isn't it interesting how prophecy lays in every news flash you can find? Closing here in this last frame here, I want to share this part here with you. I said to you that at the end of this broadcast, I would share how what is happening in Israel today may very well have a very prophetic implications on the latest UN Resolution 2334. Because we read over here in an article rebuffing Israel, U.S. allows censure over settlements, December 23rd, 2016, New York Times, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel, who had scrambled in recent days to stop the measure from coming to a vote, issued a blistering denunciation afterward. Israel rejects this shameful anti-Israel resolution at the UN and will not abide by its terms. Mr. Netanyahu said in a statement, at a time when the Security Council does nothing to stop the slaughter of a half million people in Syria, it disgracefully gangs up on the true democracy in the Middle East, Israel, and calls the Western Wall occupied territory. Part of this he's right about. When it comes to the, West, the Western Wall being occupied territory, it's not occupied territory. It is Jewish. The Temple Mount is actually Jewish as well. But nobody's going to let him have that. I'm thinking that perhaps Daniel 11 verse 40 may be a reference to Netanyahu. And at a time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the country and shall overflow as he passes through. I've believed for quite some time now that Israel is the king of the south. Netanyahu was anointed by Mike Evans to be a king over Israel. And yet Micah says, is there no king in thee? As thy counselor perished, Micah chapter 4, when Israel has been promised to be returned to her homeland, but then Micah oddly says that Israel would be driven out of Jerusalem and be forced to dwell in the fields. I've known for quite some time from this prophecy of Micah that we would be driven out of Jerusalem as a result of this latest UN resolution. But we also see, too, that this king of the south, which I believe is the Israeli king, will push at that king of the north. Now, the Pope of Rome is that king of the north. But don't forget, his Roman military is NATO. And he will send them in to enforce that resolution. Something will happen, and they will turn on Israel. And I believe that's about to happen. So see, my Palestinian friends, I'm not against you. I'm not against you being able to, to reside in the land of Israel. Israel's not been against that either. I don't say that everything the government has done has been right. I realize that. I know that that's true. There's been a lot of evil done from the government. But you've been influenced majorly by Rome and outside powers to turn around and do evil to Israel as well. Somewhere along the line, we need peace. But you know they're going to try to fake a millennial reign. You know when the Bible says that the, when that prince shall come, talking about the Messiah, he will rule with a rod of iron. Believe me one thing, the Pope of Rome, when they come and they establish their fake millennial reign, they'll rule with a rod of iron. They'll think they're supposed to beat and kill people with it just like they've been doing all along with their Roman army. I'm Stephen Burnett.
Thank you for watching. God bless you. As we near the end of 2016.